Next, we have a very stimulating conversation on moral humility between the Dean of Harvard Business School, Nitin Noria, and the district governor nominee of District 3141, Rotarian Sandeep Agarwala. Nitin Noria is an Indian American academic and serves as the 10th and current Dean of Harvard Business School and the George F. Baker Professor of Administration. He's also a former non-executive director of Tata Sons. During his tenures at the Harvard Business School, Nitin has made a lot of changes. He focused on business ethics and made HBS more experimental and especially more global. He's one of today's most sophisticated corporate thinkers, not only in management and strategy, but also his intellectual interests centered on human motivation, leadership, corporate transformation and accountability, and sustainable economic and human performance. Rotary is a global network of 1.2 million neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers who see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Solving real problems takes real commitment and vision. For more than 110 years, Rotary's people of action have used their passion energy and intelligence to take action on sustainable projects. From literacy and peace to water and health, we're always working to better our world and we stay committed to the end. In this quest, it is imperative to bring into its fold persons with a good moral compass, which is why Rotary chooses its members. Being engaged in the challenge sections of society, Rotary's work is a chorus of hope around the world. Watching societal discourse, one often experiences a longing for an authentic discussion of the core values that should be guiding us. It appears we are morally adrift. It is not that society is largely immoral, just amoral, lacking a clear compass or a foundational guide. Humility is that crest of human excellence between arrogance and lowliness. Moral humility is a matter of balance. Neither do people with moral humility believe they have low moral worth, nor do they see themselves as a moral authority. They see their own moral competence accurately. Morally humble people also appreciate the moral strength and behaviors of others. Moreover, they focus on moral learning, are willing to learn from others, ask for support, and admit their own mistakes. Leaders with this ability generally bring about less unethical behavior on the part of followers. We are fortunate to have amidst us today, Dean Nitin Noria, and to have a conversation with him on moral humility. Nitin, thank you for joining us today. Very, very warm introduction. Thank you so much. I'm uh, very excited to be a part of this conversation. My father was a member of the Rotary Club in India and served as a uh, actually the chair of one of its chapters. So I have a long and very warm affection for the Rotary Club. Thank you. I don't know if you're aware, but Rotary International's president, Herbert Taylor, introduced the four-way test in 1931. The four-way test of the things we think, say, or do is a test used by Rotarians worldwide for the last 88 years as a model code for personal and business relationships. The test can be applied to almost any aspect of life. So what is the four-way test? One, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And lastly, will it be beneficial to all concerned? The four-way test is Rotary's lodestar. How relevant do you think it is today? In some ways, you know, it's extraordinary when you just hear that four-way test that uh, if we were to apply it today, how much better the world would be. And, uh, you know, you think about the first test, uh, is it true? Uh, people are describing that we live in a post-truth world. So just that idea that uh, what we say should be true and we should be attached to the truth, uh, you know, Harvard's motto is Veritas, which is the permanent search for truth. So in some ways, there's such 
resonance between that core value that the Rotary has its first test and what we experience today. So at no time do I think is in fact that first test more relevant. Is it fair? Uh, just think about what COVID has again revealed to us that so much of society is unfair, that the costs of any tragedy are borne by the most vulnerable in society far more than those of us who are privileged. So you and I can escape into the comfort of our, of our homes and socially distance ourselves and take care of ourselves. But uh, even in the United States, a rich country, there are people who are considered essential workers. The essential workers are often the poorest workers. They're the ones who are still coming and for them to earn a livelihood means that they have to take the risk of getting COVID. So uh, we are learning that in so many ways, if we were to ask ourselves the question again, is it fair, we would do a better job. Uh, uh, does it build goodwill? Right? We seem to be living in a world in which political opposition has turned into literally people not being able to have dinner conversations with each other. I, I, we now shudder at times to invite people of different political persuasions who are our dearest friends sometimes to dinner parties because we worry that our friendship might be diminished by these divisions that we now experience in life. So to build relationships in which our goal is to promote goodwill is such an important thing. And uh, the fourth test, which you know, is in the end, the most uh, important test, which is, is it beneficial to everyone, right? Like, are we actually in the business of improving society? Are we in the interest of improving the welfare of this planet? And in some ways, you know, I, I think that in that test, what Rotarians remind us is that while we're each individuals, we're also members of society. So if society as a whole suffers, in some ways we suffer too. So it is, of course, important that we be other oriented, but even if we just thought about enlightened self-interest, I think it is good for us to always ask the question, is what we are doing beneficial for others? So I think it's a fabulous four-way test. And if more people were to follow that test today, the world would be a better place. I think the beauty of it is that it's timeless and uh, yeah. the way you explain it is really beautiful. But it feels, A, it's timeless, but it feels more poignant today, right? So sometimes things that are timeless have a special resonance at a moment in time. And I, at least, you know, as I hear that four-way test, it feels to me even more relevant today in some ways. Now, whenever we see examples of ethical or moral failure, our knee-jerk reaction is to say, that was a bad person. We like to sort out the world into good people who have stable and enduringly strong positive characters and bad people who have weak or frail characters. So why then do seemingly good people behave badly? Look, this is one of the great moral questions that people have asked for a long, long time. Uh, and I came to think about this question very deeply through the work of a, a great psychologist, social psychologist and moral philosopher by the name of Stanley Milgram, who was a professor at Yale. And uh, in the aftermath of uh, World War II, he was Jewish. He, he just couldn't understand how it could be that an entire nation of German people could have done what they did during the Holocaust to Jewish people. He says, you know, is it possible that every one of these people was evil. Like to believe that requires in some ways to lose your humanity too, right? To just believe that there could be a group of people where everyone was personally evil. So he conducted a set of experiments at Yale where uh, he invited a group of people literally off the street, a randomly selected group of people. And they were put in a setting in which uh, they were the instructor and there was someone else who was the learner. And if the learner made a mistake, they were supposed to give an electric shock to the learner to try and encourage them to do better the next time. And of course, what they didn't know was that the learner was a confederate of the experimenter and was not a real learner. They thought the real learner was just another person like that because they would invite two people into the room. They'd have them draw a card and one person would be put in the learner configuration and one person would be put in the teacher configuration. What they didn't know was the game was rigged so that the learner was always someone that was the person who was the experimenter. And, you know, the electric shocks would go up to 
bolts that would kill the other person almost. Like the last measure on the electric shock was XXXXX. And at the simple instruction of a person who was standing in a lab coat who said the experiment requires you to continue, two thirds of the people were willing to give a person who they thought was just their peer and had been by random choice assigned to the learner condition, a electric shock up to the level of XXX, just because there was a person who was in an authority position who stood there as the experimenter telling them, you are required by the experiment to continue. If the person said, but I'm feeling uncomfortable, all that the person would say is that you're required by the experiment to continue. If you stopped and you just said, I'm not gonna do it. It's not like there was any handcuffs or any prisons or any penalty that you would get. So it's a, it puzzles Stanley Milgram and it has puzzled me forever to say that two thirds of people, people like you and I, could have been the people who ended up giving electric shocks to an innocent person just because someone in authority said that that was something that we needed to do. So that was the root of recognizing that we all have moral overconfidence. So when we show those experiments to our students at Harvard Business School in a class, and we tell them that look, two thirds was the result. And then we ask people to write down privately whether they thought that they would be in the two thirds. How many people do you think admit that they were gonna be in the two thirds who would pull the shot? Less than 10%. So we all somehow feel that, you know, I would be that morally brave person who would have been able to stand up in that situation. And it's all these morally weak people who end up doing the bad things. I think it's really important to recognize that uh, there are many, many societal influences that might cause us to behave in ways that belie our own moral values. It can be at times a person in authority, my boss told me to do this. We can justify things based upon what we think are societal norms. Bribery is common in India, the only way I can get things done, or in many other parts of the world. Don't, there's nothing wrong with this, everybody else does it too. So we justify behavior by saying that everybody else does it. It can be under the pressure of incentives. Uh, you know, We saw this at Wells Fargo, that a company creates incentives for people to get bonuses based upon how many accounts they open. And it's a little surprise that many people decide that they need to open accounts. So there are, it can be done under time pressure. People can sometimes feel like, I don't have time to get this done right, so I'm gonna cut corners to do things in the short run. So there are many, many societal influences that we've learned over time that can cause us to be led astray from our core moral values. And that doesn't mean that we don't hold those values. It's just important for us to have the humility to know that there are times when under pressure, we may betray the values that we ourselves hold dear, and at other times may in fact follow. Which actually leads me to the next question uh, is that with leadership and intellectual overconfidence, which you just mentioned, comes power. How does one disabuse this person so he doesn't suffer from moral overconfidence? So I think the single most important thing, uh, you know, Lincoln, who was a much better, uh, Abraham Lincoln, a very wise and extraordinary person, uh, you know, he led the United States through the Civil War, one of the truly darkest period in American history. Uh, and he was once asked uh, during the Civil War, uh, how do you test a person's character? And people say, you know, does adversity show us what is the true character of a person? And Lincoln said, you know, having lived through a period of great adversity, uh, I actually think that people rise to adversity they show the better side of their character in adversity. The real test of a person's character is to give them power. He said, I've seen so many people who were soldiers, but when they get promoted to sergeant or from sergeant, they get promoted to general. Uh, something about that power gets into their head and their character ends up being uh, now more challenged and their morality, in fact, ends up being more suspect. So as a person who has taught leadership and is a part of an institution that is going to produce people who are very likely to gain more positions of power over time. I've been thinking about this a lot, which is what is it that we can do to enable people who become more powerful to sustain their moral humility? The only answer I've been able to come up with is, you know, that all Indian answer of who you surround yourself with, you know, this uh, idea of Sangat. 
is a very powerful idea. Uh, but it's not just who you surround yourself with, but do you create the conditions that they can call you on the mistakes that you make? Do you remain open to the people who are around you saying to you, I'm not sure that that is consistent with our values, or I'm not sure that you're being consistent with your own values. Having these truth speakers around you, because whenever you're in a situation like this, and we have seen this from literally every moral failure that we've seen from Enron and otherwise, there was a person who spoke up. There is never ever a situation that we have seen of a moral failure where the leader did not have someone close to them who spoke up and said, this is wrong. The question was, was that person listened to? Was that person someone whom you paid enough attention to? So we cannot in these moments easily believe that there will be something in us that will give ourselves the definite. You almost have to rely upon others. This is where teamwork and having people on your team who will call you out, but whom you trust and when they call you out, you will listen to them. I think that in the end is the only systematic defense that I have seen of people who remain morally humble over time. We are living through some very unusual times. And the recent crisis due to the pandemic has shown up a number of fragilities in many areas. Geopolitical tensions are increasing, economic and racial inequalities deepening, the revelations of working from home affecting many sectors badly, for example, jobs, real estate, the migrant workers in India at a totally loose end and so on, I can go on. Do you think values and ethics have taken a hit both from business and government? I think they have been exposed. I think some of the failures in our values have been exposed more deeply at this time. And sometimes, at least maybe I'm an eternal optimist, my feeling is that when society is sometimes, uh, its moral failures are revealed very sharply at a time in crisis. Those can often be the opportunities for recovery as well. So just take uh, what was perhaps a little bit more uniquely American, but in some ways reflects issues I think exist that exist everywhere in the world, uh, which was the racial issues that came to full four in the middle of COVID, right? We were already learning in COVID that uh, the people who were affected by COVID were not, were disproportionately from um, underrepresented minority communities in the United States. Then of course we had the killing of uh, George Floyd that led to America being in really having to come to terms with the racial inequalities that are in this country. It was a very painful moment to have to confront this moral failure that how is it the case that again and again and again and again, again uh, you find yourself in a position where innocent black men and women are being killed by the police in circumstances that are horrifying. By the way, uh, there was a great book written by uh, an author uh, called Cast, Isabel Wilkerson, that shows that you know those of us from India should be very mindful that we have a similar system in India. And if you go all over the world, you'll actually find there's a caste system of some kind in every part of the world where there is an underrepresented minority. So I hope that this moment which revealed how over time we almost learn to neglect these inequities in our society or almost live with them, right? Like we've all, I certainly at this moment thought hard about how we experience poverty every day in India, but we just literally have become numb to it. We just say that, you know, that's just the state of, of the country and there's not much that I can do about it. So I actually hope that this will be a moment in which the sharp way in which our moral shortcomings have been revealed will actually lead to a moral reawakening. I, I, I certainly see that on race in America. I, I sense a broader moral reawakening around that question here. And that gives me a little bit of hope that maybe this will be a moment in which, uh, you know, as they say, the darkest hour is the hour before sunrise. And, and maybe I'm just permanently optimistic in that way. But uh, I, I do feel that this is a time which will hopefully cause us all to think that how do we make sure that this is not the world in which we live going forward? So let's look at our politicians. Uh, I think we need some awakening there too, or reawakening there. 
Uh, there are politicians who appear to be liberal by conviction, but conservative by temperament. The moral burden they carry is of the politics of avoiding the lesser evil. Though at one level, this is a responsible attitude. It runs the risk that liberal politics justifies itself against a lesser evil in relation to one which looks better. It seeds ambition and any risk taking to the right wing. How do you think this impacts civil society? So look, I think that there is a risk right now in society that um, the middle is being squeezed out by both the far left and the far right. So I actually don't think it's just a problem of the of the right versus the left. I, I actually think that we are living in a world in which uh, the difficult position to hold now is center left and center right. The easier, it's almost as if our politics have been captured worldwide. And by the way, this is there's been lots of books that have been written about this. That we seem to be living through an era in which uh, populism and authoritarianism of various kinds, both the versions of the left and the versions of the right are gaining ascendance everywhere in the world. And liberal democracies in, in, in that sense of the word liberal, as opposed to liberal in the sense of being either left or right, but liberal democracies where you really believe that the purpose of democracy is a system of how to develop compromise and goodwill, right? Like my view of democracy had always been that the world is always full of two types of people, right? So there are people who are a little bit right and there's a people who are a little bit left. And by turn, we each give the opportunity for the other side to run society for a period of time. So when the right wins, uh, they get to get two of their ideas and I get to get one. And after a while we say, okay, now you got your turn. Now I get my turn and I get to get two of my ideas and you get to get one. And through this process of compromise and then on an occasion accepting that in this turn, we may give the people who are one side of society a little bit more of a privilege to get their ideas moving forward. And on another turn, we might give people who are other set of ideas a little bit of more of an opportunity. This great idea called democracy allowed ourselves to make progress in a world in which actually there is a plurality of interests because there is no, if all of us had one interest, there would be no politics, right? The reality is that people have slightly different visions of how to live life. But yet we have to live in a shared society. Just because we have different visions doesn't mean we can't live in a shared society. So I believe we somehow need to all be more determined to recover that core feature of how we live together in society, knowing that we have different interests, but we yet have a shared interest in living together. And somewhere I feel today that politicians have discovered that winning elections is about mobilizing the most vocal members of their party and the most vocal and activist members of their, of their parties tend to be the ones who are the most extreme. So I actually blame all of us for being the ones who end up being, whether we're on the left or the right, it's the center that has become quiet and has become in a sense, less forceful. And we're all a part of that center. And I think we should, you know, this is, if I was to say something about, you know, Rotarians, let's take it, or my colleagues, we all say, oh my God, I don't wanna be involved in politics. You know, let all these other people be involved. Uh, if we keep saying that, then we'll get the politics that we have today. So at some level, uh, people at the center have to get more engaged. Which actually, uh, I, you know, uh, if, if you, what do you think of author John Williams' view in his novel, Augustus? And, you know, I quote from there, it seems to me that the moralist is the most useless and contemptible of creatures. He's useless in that he would expend his energies upon making adjustments rather than upon gaining knowledge because judgment is easy and knowledge is difficult. I think it's a profound statement, right? It's a, it's a, that's a profound statement because uh, I think we're very quick these days to judge other people. And, uh, in fact, we've become so quick to judge other people that we think that from one statement that they make, we can judge the whole person. So in the United States, you know, this takes the form of, uh, if you voted for Trump, then I know everything about you and in every way you're evil. Uh, or on the other hand, if you believe that 
the far left Bernie Sanders, if you voted for Bernie Sanders, then too, I can predict everything about you. You're kind of some liberal socialist who doesn't even believe in capitalism and all these things. So it's so easy for us to make the other feel very, very different from us by engaging in this act of quick moral judgment so that we lose some capacity for appreciative inquiry. We, we lose the capacity to understand and to think more thoughtfully about where might we have things in common and what do we learn from the places that we have these differences? Like these differences must stem from some deep reason that I have to think differently from you. So if I don't even allow myself to, to engage in that understanding, to try and seek that knowledge, right? So I, I remember a group of my colleagues from Harvard Business School, we took a trip to Mississippi. So, you know, uh, in the United States, Cambridge is blue, blue, blue in every sense of the word, right? Like we are left, you know, we, we are considered a part of democratic in every sense that you might in, in, in terms of the party and, and very liberal in their orientation. And Mississippi is red, red, red. So like th these are literally two of the most contrasting places you could find in terms of the political spectrum. And when we went to Mississippi as faculty members, I was so struck by, you know, would sit at lunch with someone and someone would say, you do know that I carry guns and that I go to church. Do you still want to talk to me? It's almost as if they were so sure that if we knew them, we would judge them for being bad people, that we would not even have an interest in having a conversation with them. So I think uh, this idea that we should be very careful to not become moralists, where we are so secure in our own view that we are right and other people are wrong, that we cease to engage in the difficult act of understanding, which is much more difficult, which is to really reach out and say, why does this person carry guns? Why does this person go to church? They don't want to be bad people in their own soul. They think of themselves as good people too. So what is it that drives them to do these things? What meaning does that have in their life? So when you talk to people like that and you really try and understand, you understand that these are people who were farmers. Carrying guns is, an, is not that they're trying to kill other people. They, that has just been the way that they have managed their land and that's the way they have been secure. Churches are the center of these communities. They don't have theater and they don't have other things that they can be a part of. So churches provide, they don't have the insurance. So churches provide the places where if someone falls into trouble. So they view the church as a resource that ends up being valuable to them. But if you don't even take the time to understand these things, you can so quickly judge and get moralistic about someone who, you know, you say, oh, that's a Bible toting gun loving person and I can't stand to understand them. And similarly, when, you know, they talked to us uh, and we actually created a real conversation, they learned a lot about, you know, what makes us anxious about guns and what makes us anxious about religion. So we could have a dialogue, but that dialogue takes work because you have to be open to developing some knowledge about the other person as opposed to just judging them. So I think it's a profoundly wise statement. And uh, that third test of the Rotarians, which is, uh, are we acting in a way in which we exercise goodwill towards the other person and expanding goodwill? I think it's very hard to be a person who meets that third test if you're a moralist and a quick moralist. So aptly put, uh, because you know when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. Do you think this could be civil societies, uh, civil society's greatest hour to grapple with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Look, I, you know, it's a, everybody these days, uh, we, there was a view of the world which started of course with the printing press that once we had the ability to democratize information uh, that the truth would become self-evident, right? Like all we needed to do was to make sure that there wasn't this priestly class uh, which somehow felt like it owned the truth and all the rest of us would just get our truth from them. Uh, and we saw how that priestly class often constructed a web of lies that 
you know, that, oh, the earth is flat or the earth is the center of the universe and Galileo was almost put to the stake, right? So the construction of the democratization of information was the great movement towards enlightenment, right? Which we've all lived, the age of reason. What I find ironical is that we now seem to be living in a world in which the absolute proliferation of information and the fact that nobody knows what information is authoritative or not. Like we get information from WhatsApp and we get information from Facebook and we get information from all these sources means that anybody can construct a set of arguments together that start to feel truthful, right? So you, people will selectively present you with facts. People will selectively present you with authoritative looking people who'll say this, that, and the other. So we are living at a time in which our alertness to this idea that someone could be constructing a web of lies that starts to feel like truth to us, and then we are gonna get captured by that truth if we are going to maintain a civil society, we somehow have to get beyond this moment. By the way, in the early moments of any great new technology, there are at times a, a period of confusion and noise and all of these things. I think we're living through a period like that. It will be a great test of civil society to see if we can rise above this hyper-information or hyper-information world in which our truth is no longer, there's no source of truth that is credible or reliable and therefore anybody can construct uh, a set of what's seemingly logical arguments. But when you actually look at each piece of the argument, uh, it, it crumbles. We need to be personally more vigilant about what we believe is true. And then over time, we somehow need to make this information sphere that we are all inhabiting a little bit more civil because otherwise we will destroy civil society. So speaking of the priestly class, uh, we have a Swami Gyan Vatsalji in India who's very philosophical and speaks a lot of sense, who differentiates between growth, progress and success. He says growth aided by ethics, such as discipline, honesty, norms is progress. That progress plus humanity morality and spirituality is success and goes on to say happiness stability and peace is only achieved when you're when you're successful would you agree with this one of the things i've learned is that the great sages of india or the great sages of every part of the world and uh, there are these profoundly wise people who have who spend their time in reflection have truths that we should all pay great attention to. So you know, an exercise that we ask our students to do at Harvard Business School is to even ask the question, how do they define success? And uh, very clearly what this Swamiji is saying is that you know, if success is just defined by how far I personally traveled, which is how many people define success, right? Many people define success by, did I get the next promotion? Did I uh, become wealthy? Did I achieve my own life's ambitions? Did I achieve my own aspiration? But his definition of success is so much broader. It's not success as personal success. It's success as is society being successful in, in, in some ways, right? Like, is it, live, is it being more moral? Is it being more ethical? Is it being more inclusive? I think if we could all embrace that definition of success for ourselves, because we are each members of society, then we would produce through that definition of success a more successful society as well. So uh, as in so many things, uh, I, I have found that the our personal willingness to embrace these definitions for ourselves is one of the ways in which we can make these definitions, broader definitions for society. To always to some risk in these things is in, in these kinds of arguments is that people somehow feel like the answer lies somewhere else as opposed to the answer lies within us. Uh, I I actually believe that the wisdom of the Swamiji would be most easily put to practice if we each redefined our own definition of success to include societal success. 
So as we wrap up this interview, you've had a fantastic run at uh, Harvard Business School. And uh, the question on everyone's lips is, what next from Dean Nitin Noria? Before I became Dean at Harvard Business School, I was a professor at the school for 22 years. And I used to always say that that was the best job what, that one could have because uh, what a wonderful thing to have the opportunity every day to teach students who are gonna have profound influence in the world to study and research and think about issues like moral humility. That was one of the areas of research that I had been able to do myself and to, to develop a course around that and to, and to teach people those ideas. So there's one vision of my life in which I could just go back to having the job that I used to think was the best job in the world before I got this one, which I have enjoyed immensely and felt very proud to have. But you know, every now and then in life, it's very rare to get the opportunity when you can think afresh about what you, what you might do in this next chapter. Uh, and I don't wanna lose that opportunity that I have as well. So I have a sabbatical for a year and I will use this sabbatical to see if what I'm most drawn to is to return back to something that I enjoyed so much for 22 years before I became Dean, then that would be a welcome move back. And I don't view it as a going back. I actually view it as a different stage of moving forward. Or is there something else that inspires me? I, I have always been fascinated with business. There could be an opportunity to not just teach about it, but to, be, to get more engaged directly in it myself. I have been fascinated by the societal problems that are being solved by the major nonprofits of the world. If there was a powerful way to get engaged in something of that nature, I could imagine doing that too. So this is a very special time in my life where, you know, I can feel so good about the 30 years that I've had at Harvard Business School. Imagine returning back to Harvard on the one hand, which is a, what a, what a treat that would, that is. And on the other hand, also imagine a new set of possibilities. So I'm looking forward to this year to see what lies on the other side. I'm so sure thank you, Nitin. That was very engaging, very refreshing. And I do hope in the one year sabbatical you have, you do consider becoming a second generation Rotarian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandeep, for this wonderful interview. And I wish every Rotarian, Rotarian the very best. And uh, I hope that you continue to be the example that I think Rotarians have always set of service to society, because uh, this is a time in which I think all of us need to think about that. Uh, and in doing that, we will make our own lives better. For those inspiring words, thanks once again, and all the best.